Thanks, Greg, and thanks, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, so, as Greg said, I work uh, in a field that many people would consider to be a bit esoteric, um, perhaps even useless, uh, the field of particle physics. Um, specifically, I'm an accelerator physicist, so I study how beams of particles behave, um, and I design particle accelerators. I design machines like the one in the picture here. This is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the world's largest particle accelerator, 27 kilometres in circumference. Now, it's been 125 years since the first discovery of a particle smaller than the atom. That was the electron. And today, my goal is to share with you the lessons we can all learn from that quest to understand the fundamental nature of matter. Now, you've just met, and I've met this morning, an incredible person. So Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. And the web is just one example of technologies that have emerged from basic physics research. And it's far from the only one. In my field alone, I can list radar, television, semiconductors, radiocarbon dating for cultural heritage, superconducting magnets for things like MRI and fast trains and perhaps fusion reactors, and many, many more. In fact, just about every piece of modern technology that we rely on today can trace its origins to basic research, much of which is in physics. Mariano Muzzicato, the economist, recently analysed the 12 key technologies in the iPhone and found that all 12 came from publicly funded basic research, two of which, touchscreens and the World Wide Web, came from CERN. So how did these innovations come from basic physics? How does that happen? What can we learn from it? Uh, in writing my book, I looked into the history of my field, and particularly, I wanted to look into the human stories. What makes these people tick, and how do their discoveries make a difference to our lives? And the first big lesson I learned in doing this is that scientific research is fundamentally a creative endeavour. Don't worry, I'm not going to explain all the equations on this slide. Instead, I want to take a cue from artists. Now, in the world of art, it's quite well known that, that creativity um, happens in this kind of way. We create by taking existing pieces of inspiration, knowledge, skill, and insight that we gather over the course of our lives, and we recombine them into new, incredible creations. In innovation spaces, we talk about the adjacent possible, right? In science, we call that standing on the shoulders of giants. We take the discoveries over many, many years, none of which made the headlines, and eventually one day, a new piece of information comes along that slots in, and a new landscape of understanding opens up in front of us. Fundamentally, we're all talking about the same thing, but science differs in a profound way. In science, we're able to find out things which are genuinely new about our world and our universe, not a new interpretation or a new combination of existing knowledge. And that's because we can gather new evidence about our world, not just through theoretical understanding. It requires more than that. It requires more than just ideas. We have to get out there and do real-world experiments. That can take time. Let's take quantum mechanics, for example. In the early development of quantum mechanics, uh, there was a bunch of people working in it, but one of the people who you'll know well is Albert Einstein. He made a prediction to do with light and matter. In fact, he, made, he predicted in something called the photoelectric effect uh, that sometimes light acted like a particle. Well, there was this physicist in California, Robert Millikan, who thought that was a reckless hypothesis, is what he called it. And he spent 12 years in the lab trying to disprove Einstein. He made his experiments better and better and better, and every single piece of data he had confirmed Einstein's prediction and confirmed quantum mechanics better than anyone had done before. It took him a further 10 years and a Nobel Prize for the experiments to change his mind uh, and decide that quantum mechanics might be real. He wasn't alone. Everyone was the same. Everyone thought this can't really be how the world works, but it is. Um, now, this is kind of an endearing human story about our inability, really, to accept the results of fundamental research. But this is why science differs from some other fields. It can completely rewrite the rules for us. We can throw out the old limitations of what we could do before and add new things to what's possible in the future. 
And today, as many of you know, almost all of our electronic devices have to be reliant on our understanding of quantum mechanics in order to work, and quantum computers are coming very rapidly um, down the line. Okay, so the next thing that I learned was that the utility of curiosity-driven research compounds over time. I want to tell you a quick story about uh, Thomas Edison, J.J. Thompson, and the light bulb. So Edison is well known in innovation circles, but I'm sorry to say he actually didn't have that many original big ideas or discoveries. He tended to sort of take other people's work, package it up, um, patent it, and build his business models around that. He did not invent the light bulb. He invented the first commercially viable light bulb. And the challenge he was facing was that the existing light bulbs kept burning out, the filament would burn out. And so he set his team to work, trial and error, trying many, many materials for the filaments, trying to improve it. One day, one of his team put into the bulb an extra electrode. It seemed when they powered it up to somehow be allowing electricity to flow or stop, and they called it the Edison effect, of course, kind of um, acting like a valve, like a valve acts for, for water. It didn't fix the light bulb life lifetime problem, however, so he patented the idea, why not, couldn't see a use for it, and set it aside. They eventually solved uh, the light bulb lifetime problem, obviously. Now, Edison used to say he has no time for the aesthetics of his work, meaning the deep underlying principles. In fact, he was sometimes quite rude about the kinds of scientists who did have time for the deep underlying principles. He used to call them the bulged-headed fraternity. And one of the bulge-headed fraternity, J.J. Thompson, key physicist in England at the time, was working in Cambridge with vacuum tubes, cathode ray tubes at the time. And first, he discovered the electron in 1897, and then, two years later, he managed to describe both in experiments and theoretically, how the filaments were emitting electrons inside not just the vacuum tubes, but also light bulbs. Now, that was a key piece of information because it was Thompson's work that got published, spread around, etc., that explained how Edison's useless valve invention worked. And this was picked up and used by early innovators to make the first electronic vacuum tube devices, leading to the vacuum tubes that would create the entire electronics industry. I'm talking radio, telecommunications, television, and of course the first computers. But J.J. Thompson wasn't thinking of applications. He set out only to find new knowledge. And yet his way of working led to more and more application over time. Another example in the 1920s, the push to understand the nucleus of the atom led to the first particle accelerators. Now, this might surprise you, but today, there isn't just big ones like at CERN. There's 50,000 particle accelerators in the world and growing, including around 15,000 that look like this. This is a radiotherapy linear accelerator in hospitals. And around half of all cancer patients in high-income countries are treated for cancer using radiotherapy, a technology invented for a completely different purpose. And yet, and yet, a survey in 2016 showed that three quarters of people could not name a single application of a particle accelerator outside of particle physics. We think it's useless. We seem particularly bad at recognizing how curiosity-driven research contributes to our ability to solve real-world problems. Now, of course, of course, we can and should use well-established knowledge to solve our current problems, but in the long term, almost everything we invent is going to become obsolete. On the other hand, the results of discovery, driven by our curiosity, tend to only grow in use over time. Therein lies a problem, right? We don't know which area of research to fund. We don't know what to place our bets on. And it seems, in many ways, that discoveries in fields like physics are serendipitous. In fact, we love to think that ideas can just fall out of the sky and into our heads and change the world. So how are we going to resolve that problem? One of the big things I learned in studying the stories of key experiments over 125 years is that you can kind of create the serendipity that makes this happen. So some famous examples of serendipitous uh, research uh, that sort of changed our understanding of and the world include Henri Becquerel, who in 1895 spontaneously or serendipitously discovered radiation by leaving a uranium 
piece on a photographic plate in a drawer. Yet he had somehow the idea to process that photographic plate without it being exposed to sunlight, which would be his normal process. Why? Like he, he chose to do that, right? So it wasn't as serendipitous as it seems. Likewise, Willem Röntgen in a lab in Germany, 1896, just the year after, discovers X-rays using the same apparatus that J.J. Thompson used to discover the electron. X-rays, of course, completely transform medicine, many areas of industry. And yet he knew when a screen was glowing across the side of his lab, instead of ignoring it, he decided to investigate further. He took the time to do that. He took it very seriously and understood that something new was happening here. Well, here's a story that you might not have heard of because it happened not in a university lab, but it actually happened in a company. It happened in General Electric in uh, New York State in about 1944. And there was a group of physicists there, a team working on particle accelerators, again, it's my field, um, for uh, applications in medical imaging. And they built a prototype new machine called a synchrotron, which was a brand new idea at the time, very exciting, really took off the LHC as a synchrotron, just you know, for the record. But they're working with one of the very first ones, and they cannot get it working because it keeps sparking. Now, this is a really regular occurrence in my kind of lab. Um, the main thing you want to ensure is that the sparking isn't so powerful that it's going to melt a hole through the side of the machine. That's bad and it produces radiation. So they were pretty concerned and they didn't want to go in and look at it while it was sparking because it produces radiation. So they set up a big mirror um, and a technician was set there to stand and watch the mirror uh, while they started up the machine to sort of watch and see what was happening with this sparking. And so one day they started up, the technician's watching, he says, oh, shut it down. I can see sparking or light or something coming from the machine. And so a couple of the physicists come and they go, okay, let's do it again, we'll watch this time, see if we can reproduce it. They start up the machine and one of the physicists described that he looked on the mirror and he could see coming from the center of the machine a bluish beam of light, this beautiful blue light. It wasn't sparking at all. And he immediately recognized that this correlated with a theory that he'd heard of from a colleague, that electrons, when you bend them in magnetic fields, give off radiation. We now call it synchrotron radiation, and it completely changed our understanding, for example, of astronomy, where the same thing happens. Electrons in magnetic fields produce all the radio astronomy signals that we work with. But he went a little bit further than just recognizing it. He went, oh, I know about this. Um, I think the color of the light, or the frequency, correlates with the energy of the electrons. So he shouted back to the control room, lower the energy of the beam. And in a half hour experiment, the light moved from blue to green to yellow to red and down into the uh, infrared. And I still think it's one of the most elegant experiments I've ever heard about um, this ability to control this light. Now today, we build national scale facilities specifically to produce this light. Has anyone heard of the diamond light source in Oxfordshire? Quite a few people. Big national facility. And it's not for physics. It's for things like drug discovery, for cultural heritage, and to study the structure of viruses, including, importantly, uh, the coronaviruses. So these are seemingly serendipitous discoveries, all of them. But when I looked back over them, I could find that there were some key similarities and requirements of the types of people and environments which produce these kind of serendipitous results. So let's go, go through them. First of all, the people had a prepared mind. I think that much is clear. They deeply studied and understood their subject. There is no substitute for expertise. The next one is that they were able to ask good, good questions. Good questions leave us open to the idea that we might be wrong. We have to set aside our biases. And a good question has to be framed in such a way that we can change our minds. And then we need to ask it so that it digs into a heart of an unknown. So for example, the physicists at GE uh, were asking at the very time that they did this experiment, is there a fundamental limit to our technology? This created lots of smaller questions in its wake, including about electrons radiating, and it's often smaller questions that actually reveal a path forward or a new discovery. These good questions, these big good questions, are really powerful motivators. A lot of the questions in my field we may never answer, certainly not in my lifetime, but it's not necessarily the answers that keep us going. It is those questions. 
Finally, you cannot separate uh, all of this work from the culture in which it happened. And I call this a culture of curiosity. What does that look like? It looks like when Tim Berners-Lee in 1989 came up with a proposal for information management, his boss wrote on it, vague, but exciting. <laughs> and let him keep going. That is important, right? It looks like the brainstorming sessions a friend of mine holds where you're allowed to come up with ideas or add to ideas, but you're not allowed to critique yet because nascent ideas need nurturing. Um, it also looks like a culture in which everyone in the room can contribute without fear or shame. And this has been shown in uh, research to be a key to, pro to solving difficult problems. There was an MIT study that showed that group success in difficult problems, including mathematics, does not correlate with the IQ of the group or the peak IQ in the group. It correlates with the social skills of the people in the group, with equal time spent talking among the members of the group and with the number of women in the group as an overall factor, not as an up to 50%, FYI. <laughs> it correlates with factor one. Anyway, so history shows us that fundamental physics has led to tangible outcomes. So the problem, though, is that we could take a short-sighted view and only want to fund research with these short-term goals in mind. But no, we have to support question asking and curiosity because it adds to our flourishing as people. Um, and it might add to our economy or it might give us an extra half a percent of efficiency in solar panels. It may very well do that anyway, but that's not why we should do it. My main uh, thing that I would implore you as people who work in, in business is let us not miss out on discoveries because we couldn't see their value before they were made. Right. Toward the end of writing my book, I decided to interview as many of my colleagues as I could because I wanted their opinions on what people could learn of, of this 125-year journey in particle physics. And I thought I'd get a range of different answers that I'd have to sort of curate into some final conclusion. But it was really easy because they all gave me the same answer. They all said, we need to learn how to collaborate. Now, places like CERN uh, are massive global collaborations now. Right? They teach the UN how to collaborate in, in, some, uh, in some circumstances. Um, and all of their work is done in, in a spirit of openness and transparency. CERN's mission in its statutes is science for peace. Uh, it w at, when it was established, it was a peace-building post-World War II project. And since then, it's always had people whose countries were either at war or are currently at war uh, or have been in the past working alongside each other to solve big problems. Now, our physical resources may be constrained in our current day, but our human capacity to generate new ideas is really almost limitless. So fundamental research and curiosity-driven research has this ability to let us throw out the rule book and create knowledge that history has shown can give us new possibilities for our collective future. And it's really through collaboration that we can realize this capacity and encourage creativity like never before. So just to summarize, if we want to solve hard problems, these are the lessons we need to pay attention to. Scientific research is creative. The utility of this type of research compounds with time that we can create serendipity, and that collaboration is key to our collective future. Now, I know, I know, not every problem can be solved with physics, and certainly not with particle physics. But what I do know is this, that the act of seeking knowledge reveals more spectacular landscapes when we do not have a final destination in mind. Thank you very much.